um, get underway here um, just with a, and just run you through the kind of format for, for this evening. Uh, myself and Patrick will go back and forth and, uh, and kind of co-host this uh, for tonight. In terms of the format, we're going to uh, we're going to start off tonight by going into some breakout rooms pretty early, as we think it's important to just to recap and do some recall based on the first week uh, the first week's learning. Um, and then when we come back into the main room, I uh, just ask that you maybe if, if somebody from each breakout room can uh, just summarise some of the key takeaways and points around maybe what you learned last week and what you would action uh, in your own environment. So if you can use the chat function in there. Uh, it was really beneficial for us last week, being able to record the text and the dialogue, uh, take it away, review it, and make sure that that we are hitting the, the points that uh, that you're looking to get out of the out of the webinar series. Following that, <clears throat> we'll then move on to our some of our guests that we have joining us tonight. It's uh, we've got three big hitters tonight. We've got Maria Sampson from uh, obviously from Rugby Canada and and the Saints in a lot of roles, and I'll, and I'll introduce her in just a second. We've got Paul Hunter from from Rugby Canada. And again, I'll introduce Paul as he speaks up. And then Scott Harland had such a good time last week that he's decided to join us again for the remainder of the series. So, you know, uh, there's some great stuff shared from Scott last week and we are delighted to uh, delighted to, to have him back. So um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll um, I know just that there's people rolling in here, but that's okay. Uh, I'm just gonna ask Pete if he can put us into the breakout rooms right away. And I'm just when we come back in and I'll introduce Maria properly when she, when uh, before we before we get going, so we'll be in our breakout rooms for five minutes, and again, it's just a recap. If you weren't here last week, um, and this is your first one, welcome. And it's an opportunity to just get a really brief summary and overview as to uh, as to maybe some of the things that we discussed and we shared. So everybody will be in different rooms. All the facilitators, presenters will be in different rooms, and it'll be a really good opportunity for us to to listen in and uh, and just hear what some some of your key takeaways are. And again, just a reminder when we come back to the main room, if somebody from your breakout room can please for, uh, just add some comments in the chat around some of your key takeaways about what you would implement uh, or looking to implement in your environment. So. Um, Oh, Brianne's already on it. Good job, Brianne. Uh, if uh, if you could uh, have one, maybe one person from your from your breakout room, just pop uh, pop some of the learnings into the chat function. Uh, that would be that would be great. <laughs> Liz is on her phone in a single digit typer. I'm sure you're probably not alone, Liz, in that regard. So just as you fill in and populate the the chat function, um, I'd like to just take the opportunity to. Um, you know, to introduce Maria Sampson, um, who is has joined us tonight. Um, I'll just kind of give a, a, a brief overview. Initially, uh, Maria was, you know, well known and renowned for her on-field uh, presence. Um, you know, so she played for Canada at the 2014 Women's World Cup, made her debut in 2011 with a comprehensive victory over South Africa, 52-17. Uh, I believe Maria alongside a fellow Prairie in the second row which is important, is that correct? Yeah, me and Danielle Rollins. That's right, yep, okay. Um, and obviously in 2012, she was named the top female rugby player in Canada. And then obviously in 2013, she was a reciprocant of the Colette, Colette McCau Mac Macaulay Award. So uh, obviously Maria is obviously now a Rugby Canada board member. She originally served as a players rep, but is, a, is now kind of taking a full position. Uh, looks after sort of governance and it kind of fits really well. Maria was uh, honoured as one of Avenues Magazine's top 40 under 40 for her sport, uh, work in sport uh, and community leadership. And also uh, she appeared in three seasons of CBC's Canada's Smartest Person. So <laughs> I'm quite confident that Maria is significantly smarter than me uh, and maybe some of the other people uh, on the call tonight. But Maria is obviously wears multiple hats. She is obviously now a rugby mum of two, so congratulations on the new arrival just just uh, just last month. She is uh, heavily involved with club rugby, her club being the Calgary Saints. So uh, please don't hold that against her if you're from another Calgary club. I know how we get caught up in her tribalism. Um, and then she's also a coach with the Mount Royal University team and obviously serves on the Rugby Canada board. So very well-rounded in terms of understanding the rugby landscape. And she's really excited tonight to talk about the exciting, the exciting things of governance and, uh, and how important they are. So if we could just give Maria a virtual hand and, uh, and welcome her up. Maria, we'll make you a co-host and uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you. You missed my cameo 
cameo appearance on Say Yes to the Dress Canada. That wasn't on your <laughs> that wasn't on your Wikipedia file. It, it randomly plays on reruns every so often, which is um, lots of fun. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. What the governance? So governance is um, a little bit subjective, um, which which is kind of a little bit contradictory when you think of governance itself. But it's uh, I have my own opinions about governance and how sh certain things should be done, and they might be completely opposite to something that you have heard before about governance. And so. If there's something that I say that is different than what you've heard, take it as if you have gotten coaching on how to pass two completely different ways. They're just two feathers in your hat and you can use whichever one you want um, at the specific time. Ultimately, governance, when you put it in place, has to work for you. And then it's very much non-negotiable. But uh, as you're putting in place, hopefully um, you can have some really good discussion about it. So. Hopefully this works for you. You have an annotation function at the top of your screen. It should be under view options and then you have a choice um, to annotate. And if you don't, then we'll just use the chat function. But if you are, how important is governance to you? And so you can do a little squiggle um, and how important is governance to your organization? If you have no idea what governance is, then use the box that says what's governance. So give that a try. So it should be at the very top of your screen view options hopefully and then annotate i'm getting some no's and that's okay if not put it in the chat so first number one to five five is governance is super important to you one not so important to you Give you some time here to fill that out. All right, cool. Okay, and now just scrolling through. So we have some twos, quite a few fours and fives, which is pretty good. Now, how about how important is governance to your organization? Whichever organization you are here with. Fives, one, what's governance? Thank you. So it seems to be maybe anecdotally a little bit lower important to your gun gov, to your organization versus to you which is probably why you're here which is cool two to three thank you for the what liz <laughs> all right so we're going to talk about governance so what is governance so in the chat you can put it if you want just a couple words what is governance what does it mean what are some of the things that pop out somebody says governance to you what do you think of Bylaws, yes, very much so. Rules and regs, structure, yes. Leadership, excellent, Joe. Controls and accountability, framework, great word. Compliance, excellent. So in its truest form, fall back when things go wrong, excellent. In its truest form, how an organization is run, about your processes, your systems, and your controls. It's really around your governance team and using the strategies. Scott talked about um, quite a bit last week. The strategy be about where you want to head, you know, how you want to lead your organization, how you're going to be making decisions regarding your priorities, your roles, what your expectations are, delegating authority. So if I'm, you know, somebody who's going to make a decision for the junior program, it may not be in the boardroom, it may have to be on the field or at the side of the field at the time. Um, and then also the legal requirements, financial reporting. It is not about operational details at all. So it's not um, how to use Sport Lomo. That's not governance. And then it's really, it's serving to, to realize your organizational goals. So what is good governance? Good governance is really about achieving the, the, the results that you want, um, but making sure that you stay true to your organizational values and accepting and your, your social norms. You can have bad governance, some people think is good governance. It's, it's really important when we think about the sports world too as well as our product is our people, our athletes and their experience. So we need to make sure that our, our governance 
works around the people that we're trying to do. Within the sports governance world, you know, you really have to try to understand the passion and your dedication of, of volunteers and perhaps not overloading them too much with rules and regulations. And we, at the end of the day, we really want to enhance our participants, their experience in the sport, the performance, and as well as the reputation of rugby within the community. So why is governance important? Again, in the chat, if you'd like. Consistency, absolutely, Jordan. Keeps people accountable. Covers your ass, very much so. Provides structure for sustainability, keeps people on the same page and direction. These are excellent, a form of measurements, creating a structure for decision making. Excellent. One of the things that I don't think was mentioned here is around participants have high expectations. So having rules in place, as much as sometimes they feel onerous, participants actually crave that. So Moff made a joke about rugby time. Rugby time should be on time. <laughs> That's the new rugby time. So even though people say that, people still get a little bit annoyed if we don't start on time, right? You do have those people. Talked about um, accountability and credibility. People put that in the chat. What about your funding partners? What about people who have casinos or bingos? They expect you to have a certain, perhaps, um, certain line in your bylaws to say that you have a junior program or you have a junior director, things like that and whatnot, being able to do raffles in 50-50. Our sport environment is quite complex. We have three different provinces here um, tonight. And you know, what maybe even within your own province, you your unions work differently, north and south, the club environment and whatnot. The people that are probably here today are the ones that are doing the most amount of work around their clubs. And, and the demands on you is quite significant. And having good governance really actually would lessen that load direction setting around that strategy. Um, really your staff and your staff could be your coaches, your volunteers, your parents, um, executive directors. They actually thrive when they're supported by good governance. So even though some people think that, you know, having no rules allows anybody to do anything, if you can put people in a box and they know they can stay in that box and they'll not have to show up for an hour and a half versus having to come, you know, for two and a half hours, that really helps. And it really gives you more time to focus what's important in your club a lot of clarity. This is my favorite one actually is the clarity that you have when you have excellent policies, procedures and bylaws. There's no gray area. Um, you can really just focus on what's important. And this type of direction that you put in your governance, it goes beyond a single individual. So me, um, you know, being a very uh, governance focused individual, if I'm no longer on the board of Rugby Canada, I'm sure that somebody will continue that governance role because of the policies and documents that I have put in place or people before me have put in place. And so really a governance framework, when you think of your own club, the high level, it really has three elements. So it has your board structure, your rules of procedure, and your distribution of work. So I'll talk about those three and then I'll just give you a little bit uh, of some, some tips of my own around meetings um, and how that can really help from a governance perspective. So when you think of your board structure, so perhaps how you are today and how you're running today, I really like this little cartoon. What if we don't change at all and something magical happens? So it's the same thing as the, you know, what if we keep doing the same thing over and over again? Is that the definition of insanity and nothing changes, right? So your board structure is really around the size. How many people do you have um, on, your, on your board to make decisions, not necessarily do the work? Um, so how many are you currently on your board? How many people do you need to make decisions versus to go out and do work that perhaps could be better maintained on a committee? Um, are people engaged at meetings? If you have a board meeting you know, every month and you have 14 board members and only 70, seven of them are engaged and there every time, maybe that's a good reason to go down to a smaller board. Who is doing the majority of the actual work at your club? Um, what responsibilities does each board member have? I imagine that most people have an operational board where a lot of the work is done at the, at the, from board members. Um, but it's important to know that the, the distribu distribution of work is, is equitable, which I'll talk about later. 
What about taking on work that doesn't fall into a portfolio? So some clubs have a VP admin, VP men's, VP women's, VP juniors, VP finance, uh, VP, I don't know, commercial. And what happens with those items that don't fall in naturally into somebody's portfolio? Who's going to do those? Is that the best way to be set up? Um, terms, how long are people engaged for? Is it two years? Do you have to re-vote re somebody in every year? Is it too long? Um, and then diversity is one. Is your entire board Caucasian and male? Do you have good diversity across your board? Are you actively seeking diverse individuals, not only in appearance, in gender, but in train of thought? Are you, as a leader within your club, are you going out and seeking the ideas or involvement of people that perhaps you butt head with? Those are where the best ideas can come from. Rules of procedure. So this is really around your um, legal requirements um, and your bylaws. And your bylaws are really unique, should be unique to your organization. And you know, myself at the Saints versus the Hornets down the street, it's totally fine if our bylaws are different because our strategy should be different. Um, where we are in the city who we're servicing is different. So it's okay. There can be templates, but it's okay. And your, your, your bylaws should actually ebb and flow. Um, that's why you have the ability to change them. Um, and, and really, when you think of your bylaws, um, do they reflect how your club is or should be governing themselves? Do you have things in the bylaws that really actually hinder you reaching your club's objectives? Um, an easy one is thinking about how dues are set. Some clubs have the memberships vote on their dues every year. Some clubs have their executive just be able to set the dues without the members. What makes sense for you? Does it make sense for your members to have a stay when they don't necessarily have a huge look into the books? Does it make sense for executive to have sole authority to change dues um, within, their, within their own power? So things like that. Have your dues changed a lot since initial adoption? If your club is 20 years old and you've never changed your bylaws, have they changed with the times? Also, most importantly, is do they comply with the act under which you are registered? Maybe you're actually not registered under an act. Um, maybe you just have a group that is called XYZ Rugby Club. Maybe you are an actual not-for-profit um, registered under the Societies Act. Your terms of reference, those are really around your, your committees. And that's actually where the work should be getting done, should be under the, the, the committee bucket. And those terms of reference is, is, it's like little, for lack of a better word, mini bylaws that really allow that committee know what they're, what they're allowed to do. Do they have any money? How often do they have to meet? Who do they report to? Do they have to give a written board report every month? Stuff like that. And then your policies, that could be your code of conduct, um, uh, if you have diversity policies, a lot of those can actually be pulled from the higher up organizations, um, you know, Rugby Alberta, going up to Rugby Canada, steal on those. Don't reinvent the wheel on policies when a lot of good work has been done by um, the other unions. And then lastly, when it comes to, um, you know, your rules of procedure, your documents are worth absolutely nothing if you don't follow them. Don't single-handedly go and revamp absolutely everything if somebody is not gonna follow them at the end of the day. Um, and the same goes if you have an old document now that you're not following, it's not worth anything. Take the time to revamp it. Um, th these types of things can actually be done quite quickly when you, when you put your head down. Oh, the one thing I'll mention about rules of procedure, which I was asked to comment on, was around um, Robert's Rules of Order, which would actually be a great, um, if you just Google Robert's Rules of Order, it's actually for uh, like Parliament, very strict rules on how you do a motion um, and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and they have kind of Cole's notes that would be very good. Um, but I can talk a little bit more about that in the meetings if you like. Oh, you're holding one up, Pete Houlihan, thank you. <laughs> They're great. Um, and then lastly, around um, kind of that framework is the, the distribution of work. And so, you know, you can have boards, your board members, your staff, your volunteers, your members, and your parents. And, you know, how, how are you going to distribute work amongst those people? Again, who does it fall on if it doesn't get done? If that happens quite often, that probably quite means that the, the governance structure that you have is not dictating enough who everything can, can be going to. 
Um, and so that distribution of work actually really falls back onto your bylaws and how your board structure is, is going. And it's an ever, it, it flows, right? So you change your rules of procedure, might mean you have to change your distribution of work. If you change your distribution of work, maybe you have to change your board structure. So don't be afraid to keep, um, keep circling around there. And then just a few quick tips on meetings, um, which you know are really, really part of your, your governance as well. Decisions, discussion, information in that order. Um, it, you know, decisions are the most important things that you can do with your meeting time. It's not, it's not having long discussions um, and it's definitely not sharing information. Think of unique ways that you can share information with your other board members that are not taking up Zoom time call. If you're going for a walk, record a voice note, record a 15 minute voice note of what you were gonna talk about in the board meeting and then send it out before the board meeting so people can listen to it on their own time. And that would be great. Behavior, there's a start and there's an end time. Stick to it. Everyone gets a chance to speak on every topic. That doesn't mean you have to. If you're making a decision, you go around the room. My favorite right now is calling out poor behavior. And so people are interrupting, off topic, rambling, overstepping. Sometimes it's hard on a Zoom call, but if something doing something that isn't so great, just hold up an X. Super passive aggressive, I know, but sometimes it's hard to find how do you interrupt on a Zoom call? And if somebody's going on and on or just saying the same thing, just hold it up, they'll notice. Talk about how you're gonna do it first. Talk about how you're gonna keep people in line. And then, and then socialize um, after the call is done. That's really important. Minutes, super, super important. Um, clear action items. Who is responsible? When are they going to get it by? Um, and is there somebody that's going to help them? Is there going to be a reviewer? Review them every single meeting. Ongoing list at the Saints. I think we've up to like 289 items, not all active, thank goodness but we go over them at the very beginning of the meeting and then we go over the ones that we've added at the end of the meeting. And we're trying to get better at consistently doing that. And then make sure your decisions are documented so you don't have what here is on the screen about emotion failing and then, hey, let's just talk about it again in, in, uh, in two months. And then seek help. It's, I'm a bizarre person. I love governance. I um, have gotten texts the night before annual general meeting being like, hey, we wanna do this. Um, can we do it? And I answer. And it has nothing to do with my organization, um, but I'm happy to help. So my contact information is there. You want to text me, WhatsApp me, find me on Facebook, send me an email. Please, please, please do. Governance um, can actually be a game changer for your club, no matter how small um, or, or how informal you run your club. Having these rules can really um, can really help kind of guide where you want to go as a club and just give it a lot more legitimacy, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic and COVID and we're probably going to have a lot more rules to follow. And that is it. MJ, that was awesome. Uh, I didn't know governance could be so fun. Uh, <laughs> if you could just save your exes for uh, the webinar a week on Monday. Um, you know that'll give us a that'll give us a week to make sure that we can uh, that we can stay on point. There's uh, tons of uh, tons of really good content in there, Maria, and, and I think it's fair to say that the masters you did at the business and in, in business admin at Queens certainly uh, certainly hasn't gone gone to waste. Um, Maria, obviously we've kind of left a window of time now. If you would like a, a breakout room for some minutes, or whether um, we could we want to move on to the next presentation, it's, it's up to your call. I, I believe there'd be some value in maybe having a quick discussion around some of the stuff you've shared but I'll leave that decision up to you. Yeah, I think that would be great. And I think really um, perhaps what to focus on is around your own board structure now, your own bylaws now. I would say, don't think about this distribution of work, but focus your own board structure now, your own bylaws now, what is working? And if you had all the power in the world to flick a light switch and make a change, what would you change? Okay, awesome. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get we'll go into the breakout rooms here right away. Um, Pete's just going to divvy up. I think it'll be random again, so you'll get to make some new friends across the prairies, which we're. Um, let people cycle back in here. We always generally lose a few because people leave the meeting, not the room. So we'll uh, we'll let them back in as we uh, as we go. We're starting to roll back in here. We'll just give it another uh, another minute or so. Likewise, if uh, if you're if you're willing and able, if you can 
maybe highlight some of the some of the key takeaways and discussions from your room uh, in the chat function. My, uh, I would hazard a guess that there may be some consistent people that were shared the last time will share their thoughts again, which is great. So we're gonna pop that in. Uh, that would be amazing. Uh, Maria, just as we uh, as we kind of close up, do you have any closing remarks? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I just I, I just want to really emphasize that I'm here if you need help, and that includes reading bylaws. Um, you know, if you have a thought or an edit, um, please 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 feel free to reach out. Don't be shy. Don't think that it's cumbersome or, or anything. Um, but uh, please do that. And, and just the the value I think in in our room was really the value around an action item list. Don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to call people out if things are not done. It's about what is best for your club. Um, and at the end of the day, getting getting shit done is really what it's about. And even one more thing to add to Maria is if we have some examples of kind of good documents, good bylaws, good rules of procedure, um, we can always share those with the entire group through our um, shared resources drive. Um, so if anybody's got ones that they consider good, or Maria, if you have some examples, um, send them my way. Um, I'll put my email in the chat here. Um, send them my way, and I'll make sure that they get um, up where everybody else can see them. Awesome. Uh, and Maria, and just on behalf of all the, the pretty provinces, you know, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, thank you very much for, for giving up your time tonight. That was uh, really excellent, really insightful. Scott, I love your recommendation in the chat as well about perhaps the provincial bodies keep copies of the club's bylaws. So there's examples in history. Uh, That's from Moose Jaw. That's from Derek. It's a really good idea as well. So. And I've just posted the presentation I gave in the chat in case there's anything that um, people want to take away from it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just looking for, for Paul Hunter. Paul, if, you're, if you have your camera on, I'd, uh, I'd love to find you. Is he still here? Yeah, I'm here. Camera's on. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Paul. Paul, um, Paul, welcome and thanks, uh, thanks again for joining us. You are a couple of hours ahead in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, I'll just give again, I'll give a brief overview of Paul and his background uh, and then I'll let, um, uh, I'll let him kind of get underway. So uh, Paul was a professional snooker player. He was a three times master champion in 2001, 2002 and 2004. Um, sorry, sorry, wrong Paul Hunter. Uh, only joking, Paul is, uh, Paul is originally from Scotland, who now resides in uh, Peterborough in Ontario. He's originally from uh, the Kingdom of Fife, and he currently holds the position of Director of National Development. Um, Paul has held a number of different roles, um, always been in, uh, always primarily been in sport. Uh, when he first moved to Canada, he worked as a, a varsity sport facility coordinator at Trent University. Uh, he also um, had a job with Scottish Rugby as a rugby development officer. Uh, and during that time, he has completed his Master's of Performance Coaching at the University of Stirling. And most recently, is, uh, he's enrolled at the Smith School of Business, uh, which is at Queen's University. Uh, Paul, um, right now, is wearing many hats, and he's, uh, he's working incredibly hard for Rugby Canada. And so we appreciate the time that he's, uh, he's given up to tonight. So I think his role title should maybe be uh, Director of National Development slash COO. So uh, I won't take up any more time or Maria will give me an X. So Paul, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Well, oh, thank, thanks very much. Um, good reminder for me to update my LinkedIn profile. So first of all, thank you very much for, for that. Um, I'll just do a, a screen share. Oh, can, whoever the host is, could they maybe give me that functionality? Yeah, sorry, Paul, I thought I had done that already. That's okay. Maybe just as, you, as you're doing that, just as Moff said, um, first of all, thank you very much, everyone, for just the opportunity to come in and talk a little bit about safe sport. Just before I start, um, I, I want to acknowledge that I'm calling from the traditional territory of Mississauga, Anishinaabeg, um, in Peterborough, as Moff had alluded to there. Um, I'm a bit worried that I'm going to get an X. I'm looking forward to our next board meeting with Maria, um, but hopefully nobody's going to show an X up during this. Um, okay, thanks, Ma.
Well, can you give me a yes or a no? My apologies. I'm not a Zoom person. We've got a thumbs up. That looks okay there. Okay, so just want to take about 10 minutes to go over the invigorating topic of safe sport, a little bit of look at our policies. Lots of great discussion and hopefully some harmonization with what Maria has touched on. Um, so, safe sport, I'm going to share a little bit about what the journey Rugby Canada is going through, um, maybe share some of our pains that we went through as we look to implement safe sport um, and potentially um, share some of the um, successes that we we'll probably have as well, learn from some of our mistakes. Just a very quick overview of what safe sport is. Um, the Federal Minister of Sport, Minister Duncan at the time, has ordered all national funded sport organisations to eradicate maltreatment in sport. Those expectations have been set out and um, will be complete or are expected to be completed by March 31st this year. Um, along with the Federal Minister of Sport, in February 2019, Minister Duncan hosted a Federal, Provincial and Territorial Sport Minister meeting, where Minister Duncan and her counterparts signed the Red Deer Declaration, and that was a commitment to the elimination of abuse, harassment, discrimination in sport, and to look for collaboration across all levels. From that a group in the graphic on there, the Aiming High document, the McLaren Global Solutions were commissioned to provide analysis and input on recommendations on preventing and addressing maltreatment in sport. Um, so consultation with athletes from Athletes Can, community clubs, provincial sport organisations, multi-sport multi organisations, government funding providers, etc. Um, it's about an 800 page document. There's no and requirement to read, but a lot of really good information was in there. Um, so there's a little bit of a um, overview of what safe sport is there on on the page. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is implement measures to protect the health and well-being um, of all participants in in um, sport. We want a safe place, both physically and emotionally, for all participants. Um, Ultimately, I'm not sure there's very many people who agree to that. And we're very fortunate in rugby where we do make game welfare our, our priority. We do want to make sure that we've got a place for everyone, no matter what their ability is, what their ethnicity is, what their race, what their gender identity is. There's a safe space for everyone. So safe sport specifically, when Rugby Canada looked at safe sport, we created a framework. And I just want to touch on four specific areas um, and I'll go into not too much detail and happy to kind of take any questions in the chat if they come up but try give some broad overviews of these areas and how they might relate to you and your your local club policies and Maria made some really good points around the importance of policies and in, in governance um, Policies are those principles. They, they should set your behaviours and expectations of your behaviours. They'll help you make decisions and they promote accountability um, for everyone involved in the sport. Why are policies important? When things go wrong and, and things do go wrong in sport, they can be your best friend. And as some advice is what Maria said that I would echo. When things go wrong, you have to follow your policy by the letter of the law, exactly how it's written. Um, if you don't have a policy, that's a real big concern. Um, as I've been told by a, a couple of lawyers, if you don't have a policy, open your checkbook, um, because that, that's an area that you really need to have in place within your organization. And we've identified a couple of different policies here um, Rugby Canada has developed a, a safe sport policy, um, also having that code of conduct and code of ethics. What are some of the behaviours that you expect of coaches, board members, participants within your club? So if there's a violation, that would be against your, your code of conduct and your code of ethics. And if you have a violation, how do you manage that? 
what does that look like? So having a complaints and discipline policy gives that decision-making process to manage the violation of the, the code of conduct. But when you have a complaint um, or you discipline one of your club members, do they have the opportunity to appeal? Again, having that appeal policy gives you a decision-making process where somebody has the opportunity to, to appeal for whatever reason. How do you manage that complaint? Is there an opportunity for mediation? And having that mediation policy, um, again, gives you that decision-making um, process so that you can treat a complaint fairly and with integrity as well. A really big piece for the federal government and the Red Deer Declaration is alignment. So the UCCMS is the Universal Code of Conduct for Maltreatment in Sport. And this is what was developed by the, the government in looking for alignment. So for example, the definition of abuse, that should really be the same across sport. We shouldn't have different definitions. One club having a different definition of abuse than another club. So there's certain things within our policies that are the same across all sports. Maltreatment, the definition is the same across all sport. Publishing sanctions, that is an expectation across all sports. So we're starting to kind of see that, that alignment. And it's really important in your appeal process that if you sanction somebody within your club, and are they able to appeal to your province? And if you have alignment within your policies and procedures, that will make that appeal process a lot easier. So moving on from policies and something that I think we do very well as a sport, a um, lot of great work done in the prairies um, around training, um, but looking at training as a, a prevention strategy, you know, so this is how we can have interventions to prevent maltreatment within sport. And an opportunity for you to reflect in your club and what training are you offered? And there's a lot of great training resources that are out there. So some of the examples, Coaching Association of Canada have a safe sport module, and um, Respect in Sport, which I'm sure many are familiar with within the, the prairies. The Canadian Centre for Child Protection has great resources, um, especially if you have a child protection officer. Are they trained within your club? Do they know how to manage a complaint and do they have the resources available to them? There's also some resources around the Responsible Coaching Movement, which is an initiative launched by the Coaching Association of Canada, but things like the rule of two. What are some of the behaviours that we can have to be preventative around maltreatment within sport? Having first aid training for relevant participants and, and coach education are some of the examples. But as a club, who's, who's trained and when are they trained? How often are they trained? And we often get, there's a lot being asked of, of volunteers, and, and there is, but I think what's at stake is really, really important. And that's a, ch that's a child or a vulnerable adult's mental health and, and their welfare. So I think if we value that, there should be an expectation that the training is going to be quite a high bar. It is going to be a high standard because of what's at stake. We're, we're dealing with the livelihood and also um, the mental health of young children or potentially vulnerable adults. To give you some ideas of where Rugby Canada has changed recently, um, trying to be more inclusive and more diverse, there's trans inclusion training for our staff. All staff must do safe sport training annually, every year. That's every national team player, every national age grade player, from the accounting department to the coaching performance, everyone does safe sport training. Everyone does rugby ready training and concussion management training. And we're currently piloting gender equity training um, with a small steering group within the, the organization. All volunteers at our events will also have to do safe sport training. So that the, the, um, the, the net is very wide in who we're trying to capture with this training and the training's ongoing as well. For those that aren't aware, hopefully most people on the call are aware, placemark.rugbycanada.ca is where we host a lot of our resources 
and you'll see there that we've got them available in both French and English. But Canadian Centre for Child Protection, Responsible Coaching Movement, Drug Education with the, the Keep Rugby Clean project um, that Scott and his team at World Rugby help facilitate. And the one that I would like to point you towards, it's a really important resource, is the Canadian Sport Helpline. That's a helpline that's available for anyone that needs to talk about potential maltreatment and abuse within sport. Um, but again, please feel free to visit playsmart.rugbycanada.ca and there's resources on that website that we try to keep up to date in both French and English. So background screening, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, is one of those other um, pillars of the framework. And across sport, it's becoming common practice within sport organisations. Um, but what are you doing within your organisation around managing that background screening? Do you have a background screening policy? Again, given those guidelines to follow and expectations of what those volunteers should be adhering to. Do you know who gets screened? Um, so often it's, um, or oh, if they're just working with children, potentially vulnerable adults in there as well. People working with finance um, would also be people that are in position of supervision or authority, um, or where there may be a risk of a power imbalance or an abuse of power. And then how often are, are these people being screened? What are they being screened for? So to give you an idea in Rugby Canada, what our process looks like, all new staff, they must have a vulnerable sector check. So that's the first step for starting with Rugby Canada is a vulnerable sector check. Every year, all staff members have to complete a renewal form. On the third year, they then have to complete an enhanced police information check, which is done online. Should anyone um, need to declare an, uh, an offence, there's a declaration um, piece in place as well. But again, this comes back to where do you have your policies and procedures? Where does the coach go to or the parent or the volunteer go to within your club to ensure that this is all in place? Or if your club is a child protection officer, do they have a policy that helps to guide them? Do we know the difference between the vulnerable sector check and the, the enhanced police check? So are we doing the relevant level of screening for people within our clubs? And my apologies for sharing the screen. I'm happy to share the slides afterwards. I, I realize this will be small text, but for Rugby Canada, we have a screening matrix and um, where we have low risk, medium risk and, and high risk. And what our expectations are around background screening. I, I will echo that you can't have a, a vulnerable sector check done or an EPIC done with a young person um, under the age of 18. So if you have volunteers, um, under the age of 18, we're looking at reference checks being done there. But does your club have a, a matrix where you can identify who needs what training and background screening checks? So the last piece that I'd like to kind of leave them off if we've got some time to go into those breakout rooms, thank you, is, is reporting. So it's really important around that reporting, having your policies, having your procedures, but how does somebody report a complaint? And I'd like us maybe just to think within our clubs or have some discussions within our clubs about how you'd respond to receiving a complaint and maybe just have a think about where your policies are, who that goes to, what would happen if you received that call that a minor was subject to maltreatment by one of your coaches? Do you have policies? Do you know where they are? How would you follow those? I would echo that I wouldn't like anyone to share any specific details within their clubs of anything that's happened, but just broadly speaking, how would you manage that reporting? A couple of things that we heard loud and clear from the McLaren report, reporting must be independent. You have to remove the bias or any conflicts of interest. So all reports with Rugby Canada go to a third party reporting and so they don't come to a staff member they can't get lost they can't be buried they must go to an independent third party and that's across all national sports to be implemented by march so i think within your club how do you manage those complaints 
Mark? Yeah, good man. Thanks for that, Paul. And I uh, appreciate you giving us the, the kind of question. Um, I know that uh, I think, yeah, Pete's already put it into the chat group. So, you know, just in case, is that your club? Discuss how your club would respond to receiving a complaint regarding maltreatment of a minor by one of your coaches. What improvements need to be done within your club to get a safe, inclusive environment? So I'm going to ask that, um, that, that Pete puts us into rooms for about five minutes. Pete, if you can, please. And then, uh, and then we will circle back in again. I'll ask if you could... Uh, uh, share your comments and feedback from your group in the chat function and uh, we will see you all in five minutes thank you again just as people uh, filter in just please uh, populate in the chat you know what the uh, what your group would like to share um, I suspect we're going to see a lot of similarities across all the groups and uh, possibly surprises from you know, from most of the clubs that haven't had to deal with this directly, so. Uh, just as the last couple filter in, I'll just take an opportunity to thank Paul for his, uh, you know, for his time tonight. And, um, you know, to, you know, just to taking the time to put something together, you know, which, which can appear quite daunting. But I know that there's some uh, some really good steps in place that's, that's come down from the NSO to the PSO. I know that here in Alberta, we've contracted with Sport Law and Strategy Group to, to have them develop a bank of policies. There'll be 27 policies um, becoming available here uh, real, real soon. And as MG said, you know, in her presentation, steal, steal from upline. You know, so we're, we're really hoping that we can support the clubs by having these finished uh, in the next month or two. I know Sean Hofstetter, our president uh, of Rugby Alberta, is working on a safe sport committee with Rugby Canada at the moment. And I know that with Patrick and, and Jordan and, and your respective provinces, Sport Law and Strategy Group are the ones, I believe, that have kind of helped develop the policies for SAS sport and Manitoba sport. So it's all, the, all very similar. They're probably the resources that we'll, that we'll end up uh, end up having. having so. And, and sorry... I just want to add to um, with policies, typically how it works is it's the, the governing body policy in which you need to follow and be aware of. So even if your own individual clubs might not necessarily have a, their own individual code of conduct or their own individual discipline or complaints policy, look to Alberta rugby, Manitoba rugby and Saskatchewan rugby, because those provincial organizations do have them in place. And those are actually the policies that you are or will be bound by. Awesome, Paul, just on, uh, on behalf of everybody here tonight, uh, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. You're also more than welcome to stick around if you want or if you've got probably more work to do or do uh, or go and, go and spend some time with your wife, then please do so. And uh, you know, we'll look forward to connecting with you again soon. So on behalf of all of us, Paul, thank you very much. Thanks, Moff, and, and thanks everyone for engaging. I'll stay on for a couple minutes more and then I'll, I'll, I'll hop off, buddy. Thank you. Uh, we, we saved the best for last, eh, Scott? Is that, is that how it works? No pressure. Uh, I don't want to follow those two. Those are great. Yeah, yeah two very good, uh, insightful presentations, Scott. So I hope you brought your A game tonight. Uh, no, delighted to have Scott back again, as we kind of kind of spoke about last week as a result of quarantine and, and, uh, and the pandemic. Scott has been uh, stranded in Manitoba. He's been there for quite some years, but maybe spending more time there at the moment than he usually does and not traveling to all these exotic, exotic places. So uh, I know we introduced Scott last week, but Scott is the regional training manager. Uh, with RAN, which is Rugby's America North, uh, and he's been with the organization for 13 years. So you know, he has tons of experience, uh, you know, of, of rugby as a, as, a, as a player, you know, which he spoke about last week playing out. He said, talked about going attending Rugby Fest in Edmonton when he was a bit younger. Uh, so playing in these events, uh, refereeing, obviously, as an administrator as well, and obviously now in his role as regional training manager. So, Scott, we really appreciate you giving up your time to, to come and support us um, with the expertise uh, that you that you have and we look forward to uh, having you kind of wrap up tonight with some sharing and in and, and a breakout room so if you could put your hands together and welcome Scott up. Thank you all very much.
Cheers, Moff. Uh, and, and perhaps more uh, salient to the topics we've been discussing uh, before all of this rugby stuff, I was the director of sport for the province of Manitoba for six years where we worked on governance and bylaws for the various sports bodies, the 88 sports bodies that we funded and were responsible for. And before that, I was uh, worked for the Minister of Health as a, as a political aide, so had some information and background there. So a lot of rugby there, but uh, uh, some other administrative and governance stuff too. Uh, I'm going to get everyone just quickly, would you type into the chat section, dogs or cats? You want to find out whether you're dogs or cats, people. Just, uh, you have, there's, there's dogs, 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 dogs for the win. Always dogs. This is good to know. Okay. So I'm talking to like-minded people. I just wanted to cover that. Uh, so uh, st strategic planning, we've had some great presentations about some of the things we've recognized are missing within uh, some of our plans and, and uh, our structures and our documents. How do we get those? Anything that we want to have that we don't already have requires a plan. How do we build strategic plans? Well, that's the big question. I think uh, when we talked last week, what we found out was a lot of rugby organizations survive by uh, session to session, by year to year, uh, next match. Uh, oh, we're short of prop. Okay, well, we'll call these people and find enough people to put a team on the field. Someone wash the jerseys. Who's bringing the water? And that's been a strategic planning for a lot of clubs for some time and a lot of teams. So what we're looking at is what do we do in order to strengthen our planning so that we fill these spots of governance and fundraising and partnerships that we want to build on. And again, we've talked about participation and recruiting more people to volunteer roles. That also takes a plan. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now and pop into this. No, I don't want that. I want this. What are you all seeing? There we are. So the planning process, what we talk about the planning process and there's lots of documents and models out there for how we build the plan. And we're gonna go over one, but if you, you can find them online, you can find lots of resources, we'll share more about what it takes to build a strategic plan. One of the first steps, find a facilitator, find someone who can help your club have a conversation about this. I've seen some comments that, hey, get your executive together and build a long-term plan. I really recommend that you get a larger body together to build your plan. Uh, find out, recruit in some of your retired players, some of your founding members of your club. Uh, recruit some of the brand new players. They're gonna have things that they'd like to see. Those founding members, find out where you've been as a club. If you find out what it took to get here and some of the lessons learned and some of the pitfalls that you've got into and dug out of again, it might help you avoid doing them or learn from them. It also helps you find out as a club, you know, we've handed over leadership and handed over leadership. My club was founded almost 60 years ago. And some of us forget how we got here. Now, if you talk about, hey, those original club members, or we got a facility, we managed to get to that point, or we got a third team, or we're coaching at schools, whatever accomplishments you've had, we added a women's team, or the women's team added a men's team. Whatever accomplishments you've had, someone did some planning. Getting those people around help you see what happened to get there and help you plan for how to get there next. One thing we tend to do is we celebrate people. Uh, hey, that's one of our founding members. Great, bring them in, buy them a drink. We oh, don't always remember to celebrate the things they did that got us here. It's much easier to learn from things people have done than to try to copy being another person. So if we say, hey, how did they get to where we are? How did they form a club? How did they organize themselves around buying into that facility or building that field? And then how can we do that again? How do we learn from that and, and create that legacy? Because then the big question is, what are we doing now to leave something for the next group? Because good planning is like planting a tree that you never plan to sit under, right? We're building because it's the right thing to do while we're staying strong now. So what are we going to build that we're leaving behind is something that people can get behind. Getting behind who's washing the jerseys next week is very short term and less easy to be uh, to celebrate when it's done. No one celebrates, hey, you washed the jerseys, we're so glad, right? But they do celebrate, hey, we're kicking off our first game on the new field. This is exciting. So when you get people together, you're talking about where you've been, where you can get to, the long-term vision. 
that future vision, if you're a newest club, might be three years from now. It might be, hey, in three years, we hope to add another team and add, you know, another age group or something like that. Or it could be 10 plus years. We're going to build an addition to the clubhouse. We're going to have a clubhouse, right? Those big plans, right? If we have long-term plans, then people can get organized around those. People don't mind contributing a few dollars extra a year or a little more work a year if they see that's the thing we're building for. We're excited by that project and we want to get to it. We heard one of the comments people said in one of the breakout rooms that uh, they remember being at their healthiest and, and best as a club when they were planning for a tour that was two years away. Because everyone could talk about the tour and everyone was putting money aside and, and building the plans and getting excited. But those long-term plans really bond a group and can make some great things happen. Make them reality-based, but optimistic, right? You want, you want it to be something you can reach for. Sometimes you want it scalable. Hey, we want to build to that, but we're still pretty happy if we get halfway there because that's still something much more than we have. And maybe it'll take longer than we hope to get there, or maybe things come up and our plan's not achievable, but we've got a, you know, the smaller scale, we still accomplish that. Have big ticket items in those big topics, right? You'll get to the finer points in the implementation plan, but the bigger topics will be long term vision. Okay, we're going to have three men's teams, three women's teams, two ages. We're gonna have uh, mini rugby for all, all sorts. We're gonna be inclusive and have this kind of diversity is what it's gonna look like. Policies and governance will be this. It, build those long-term plans of what it will look like in the future. What's the picture you see? From that is when we get to the other exciting bits. So that's when we get to, okay, how do we break those down? You build that long-term vision with the club's input. People should have some, say in which direction their boat is going, right? You're all gonna get on the same boat and you're gonna head somewhere. If you want them to row, they should probably have helped pick the destination. So now is when we get those leaders and the staff and they get together and they say, okay, based on those long-term visions, how do we break those into manageable goals? How do we break it into what do we need to do next month? What do we need to have finished by next year? What do we need to plan maybe three years from now that we should be at this stage for that, right? How do we get to each of those bits? And that's, that's a bit of the tricky part, but some of these goals kind of self-direct. Uh, you you want to have more players, you want to have more teams, you're going to have to build on participation. How do you do that? Well, then you get to the implementation goal. Okay, we're going to have to get into more schools, we're going to have to improve transition from schools to this, we're going to have to start a youth rugby club maybe, get a mini program going, whatever it is, you can build that plan in and that can be the direction you go. And then you revise and review and that we'll look at the implementation plan uh, now we sent those out, they're in the, the documents. The implementation plans, when we talk about SMART goals, valuable to be specific. So we are going to have two more teams uh, playing within our club, you know, one guy's and one girl's team uh, within two years. Okay, that's pretty specific. Now it's measurable. Is it achievable? Probably. Right. Is it realistic and relevant? Like, yeah, with that, we want more teams and that's important to us. Uh, and is it time oriented? Yeah, within two years. Otherwise, you say, hey, we'd like to have a clubhouse one day. It never happens. People don't have anything to move towards. So make them smart goals. When we break out, we're going to get some practice, uh, make them into smart goals. So actually, we're going to jump to that right away uh, because we, we're going to finish. I have a few uh, comments after the breakout room to wrap this together. So just want to uh, jump into that. We're going to pick, uh, we, we picked the one task, I think, uh, Andrew and Peter, isn't that right? We, we, we gave them all the same topic earlier. Yeah. So, uh, so here's the question. I'm going to bring up that implementation uh, plan here. So we're going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to drop it into the chat room so we can see it. And then we'll get a chance to go in there. So there's a template. You should all be able to see that club implementation template. I'm going to open it up and then just share screen again quickly so that we have a look at what we're talking about. And this is when we take that bigger item and we uh, make it a bit more specific. So, so let's say we're going to SMART goal, we're going to transition 25% of our youth players to adult club memberships uh, next season. How are we going to do that? So this is when we put in the steps it takes to do it. The how might be one, two, three. It might be many steps. 
don't worry, we'll, we'll go for the when, we know it's for next season. Who will touch on when we get back together? But have a look at what resources you think will be needed based on the ideas you come up with. Like what is, what, I'll just uh, ask someone uh, randomly take off your mute and what's an idea you could use to try to get 25% of your youth players to come over into the club adult rugby. What's one idea? Have a uh, shared club uh, practice with your uh, your high schools or invite youth members to your club to practice with them. So they build the bridge and relationships that way. There we go. So that's one idea. So we can have right there, share, share practices, right? So we put that kind of thing in there. What do you need to do that and all those steps? So we'll have a few steps. So we'll break into the groups, come back with three, four, five ideas of how you would get that to happen. Implementation plan, what resources you think are needed. And here we put the review dates. The review dates that we talk about is when does the, whoever delegated the task need to check on it? When does the executive member responsible for participation or the club president or whoever's handling the, the review, when, do they, when are they gonna check with the people in, uh, involved? Um, what's the result of that? Because that's when you find out, do you need more resources? Do you, you need a different, do we need to change the goal? Is there something that's come up that we didn't recognize? Uh, do you need more help, more volunteers? Are you not the right person for it? That's okay to find out too. If they say, I can no longer be responsible for this, I just got too busy. Best to find out partway through the task instead of when you wanted it to happen. And then we have those review dates. Planning your review dates is an important part of the task and the delegation. And I know we talk about that in a later session under job descriptions. So I think next week or the week after. So we're gonna break out of those uh, rooms. We're gonna give them uh, their uh, handful of minutes. Shouldn't take long. We're gonna come back in about, uh, what were we giving them, five minutes in the rooms? Five minutes should do it. All right, so send them off to the breakout rooms, come back with your five ideas on that. Okay, just as people filter back in, uh, just throw uh, throw the ideas or the ideas we had uh, in, into the chat. And if we get the conversation started, it's be quicker when we the uh, rest of us join in. And just as something that came up in our in our group that we were in is that consider that twenty percent high school uh, retention rate is. is would be considered outstanding by uh, by the national averages. So don't beat yourself up too much if you're not getting near that. Yeah, 20% 20, 20 would double, what, more than double what national averages are in much of the world for retention of youth rugby players. So a retention of youth athletes to adults. So that we, can we aim for that and build it up over time? Um, perhaps, perhaps we make more spaces for them. We had some neat ideas coming out of our room. Um, it's an opportunity to share ideas with people as well. Let's talk about the implementation planning of it. So then we say, okay, we've got an idea. One of them was let's have family days, right? Let's make sure that we're showing uh, from youth to adult to the veteran player. We're gonna have a whole bunch of rugby this day for our club where everyone comes out from the minis to the you know 72 year olds who are gonna play their thing. And it's picnic and it's barbecue and everyone's welcome and invited and they get to see that this rugby community is a healthy happy place for young people to be at and for you to find your path and say I, I can be those people later great so we got a family day how do we implement family day right well that's going to take people are going to have to organize barbecues people you know and food uh some are going to have to schedule the teams and organize that uh how are we marking the field that day well that's going to take some work so there's a number of tasks we put there some of them are immediate and they just happen for the day. Some of them are long-term. Hey, if we're gonna have 150 people once a month at this field, we should get a sponsor, right? Someone would probably wanna sell us refreshments. Someone would probably wanna sell us food. Let's get a chip truck, right? We have those kinds of conversations. So those are bigger long-term plans. So we, put, we make it a lot of items to accomplish out of that plan. So now I'm gonna to get to, uh, uh, the last stage of this, once we have those implementation plans, once we built that up and we have, okay, we know th these are the things that are needed and we're going to view the slideshow. Everybody gets some. 
once you have those implementation plans, once you know what you plan to do for participation, once you know what you plan to do for governance, resources, these other things that you need to put in place, uh, whether it's high performance or your facility plans, you have these plans, they were based on a long-term vision that your club member said, yeah, that would be exciting, let's get to that place. Okay, here's how we can get to that place. Put it back up there and everyone picks up. This isn't for the executive. No one, got, no one got elected to a position so they could be the custodian of everyone's wishes, right? They're not, they're not just there to, they're there to help make some decisions and guide the boat, but everyone's got a row. So people can, what's a, what does it take to be a member in good standing? Maybe a club member in good standing has to commit so many hours a month or a year towards uh, some, of these, some of these tasks and projects. Clubs don't implement strategies, people do. Your union doesn't, your provincial union doesn't create more players, people do, right? It's up to the people involved. So when we say, hey, my, my club's not doing anything. Well, I'm one of the people in my club. I could be doing something. So uh, when we, if people don't put their hands up for some of the tasks, you mention it, you say, hey guys, there's no one uh, taking part in planning the barbecue for these family days. So if, uh, if no one signs up for it, we're not gonna have barbecues. If no one signs up, it doesn't mean the executive members do it for everyone, because then no one ever wants to be an executive member. We've got to draw a line. And they will pick it up if they care about it. But draw that line and say, I don't see anyone signed up for uh, these particular tasks. If no one cares about them, we'll park them. We just won't do them this year. And we'll see if you want to do them next year. We got to do that. People have to be able to step up to take on the things that they want for their long-term vision. It means some things don't get accomplished, but they're not going to get accomplished if a small executive is trying to do everything themselves. And that small executive will get tired of it. And when they leave, they won't leave and say, I'll take on some other stuff. They'll be gone. They'll be tired of it. And we don't want to burn people up. We keep people happy. We talk about more of that in future sessions. But the implementation plan, make it a big group. Don't make it small. Uh, anything built in a vacuum tends to suck. So. Uh, I, that, that would be the last bit of advice I'd have on that. Uh, the review dates for implementation plans. Make them soon, the first one soon after people are delegated. Check within a few weeks. See if they move forward. They need a prompt. They need, you need to know what problems they're having and know how to place other things. Um, a question, and we'll, get, we'll do it more in delegation and the like, but a thought as we leave. How many of us have done a... Uh, talent test of our rugby club. What are all the knowledge, skills, professions that you have in your club, in particular talents that people could bring to bear from time to time, if for a little bit, I mean, you don't want to make, make the mechanic repair the school bus five hours a day, but what are, the what are all the different talents you have in your club and how can you apply some of those to some of the, this, uh, the strategic plans and implementation plans as well? Um, that's for, that's for another session though. We'll get that in a week or two. Sorry, jumping around. Thank you for uh, uh, taking part in that. Uh, I'll wait for any questions on that and they can type them into the chat when we can answer that. And then uh, we'll give that two minutes and then we'll close it. Stop sharing. Either unmute yourself or you can throw a question in the chat, everybody. Hey Scott, it's Maria here. I'm curious how you go about sharing the list of activities that you would do. Would it be via email to try to get people to sign up? Would it be in person? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So uh, we've seen a couple of examples. One where we've had everyone in a room, uh, like the club, hey, we're not practicing tonight. It's more important that we all agree on some strategies. We, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, this is a good attendance night usually. Uh, so let's say it's first Monday of the month or whatever, whatever's a good attendance night. Good attendance night, we're going into the room and the executive has come together with these implementation plans. Here they're up on the wall. Come and sign your name to any of these tasks on these flip charts around here and the ones that have more than three names, we're gonna do. So that's one way I've seen that was successful. Uh, email is another one. Uh, Google Docs allows you to send things out and have people sign up to it online and then you could track it that way. Uh, so there's other online versions of that that are more sophisticated than, you know, than, than Google Docs or than I know of, uh, but some of that software. 
Um, I'd say email, uh, I'm leaning away from email more and more now as a means of communicating. Uh, I'm finding a lot of people prefer that to be their work thing and their long-term messaging stuff. But if you wanna pull a group, that's right. Uh, Survey Monkey uh, could be quite cheap. There are free versions of uh, email surveys. So I, I might use one of those if I was emailing because some of those are apps as well that you can survey and, and find out from that. But I do like the idea of being in a, in a place where discussions can happen so that people can talk to each other. And you know, hey, uh, Patrick, I'll, th that's pretty important. I don't wanna take it on myself, but uh, if you'll do it with me, why don't we both put our names on that? Yeah, sure, I'll put my name on that if you do it too, because I know the two of us will get it done. All right, uh, I, having it in a place where the club talks to each other, reminding them to talk to each other, I think is important. Maybe Scott, as a follow-up, I think uh, um, one of the comments in the chat here um, is that kind of there's a critical mass of people doing stuff at the top. Is there maybe like to stick with the theme of this evening is maybe there are some structural solutions that clubs can implement here. Um, I know obviously boots on the boots on the ground actually getting getting two people and asking them to do stuff is the secret sauce. But is there anything uh, that clubs can do structurally to maybe prevent that critical mass at the top um, from happening in the first place. Yeah, and, and uh, so some, some clubs have, everyone gets a title, right? And, and you better put your name beside one of the titles and it might be, I'm um, social assistant. And social assistant, great. Well, when we do run our fun, funding events, when we do run our barbecues, when we're having a bar night, you're gonna be expected to put in full hours on that, yep but everyone has to sign up for one of the roles in the club and that builds small bits of responsibility around that social assistant well you're going to have to go to pick up the beer from or arrange the beer with the vendor all right um i'll learn to do that so we everyone gets some sort of job uh, in the club so they all know i'm not here just as a player who gets to leave and show up and play and leave uh i'm actually part of a club and that's that's different and other sports so and then that helps you build um, sort of hierarchies of hey everyone's got a role and it leans on a bit i know we talk about that in the future session about how to arrange roles so that people don't run away from them and they're happy staying in them uh, so we'll get that but you're right we, we tend to take on the responsibility at the top and then do all the jobs ourselves and we've got we we do need to get away from that uh, every everyone who gets elected to a leadership position, your first job is choose two replacements and start training them, maybe three. Start training other people to help you with the job. Find young players, find new players. Um, that might, they might be so excited about having rugby that they don't know that they're being tricked into work. But uh, find some replacements and start training. You might never use them, but you're going to have people you've delegated work to that are learning responsibility and growing, and it's easing your job and your workload. And then you feel that when you do leave, it's in good hands. And we'll talk more about this at uh, in the next couple of sessions. not hearing any other questions i'll uh, thank you all very much for letting me chat with you again and listening to me, me ramble on and i'll throw it to andrew or moff or whoever's going to close us up that's all right thank uh, thank you very much scott i think um definitely the quote of the night with that anything built in a vacuum will probably suck as a it's a good one um thanks once again to uh, all our presenters i think marie is still on the call but she might have jumped off thank you very much Paul as well, who's now left us, and, and Scott again, thanks for coming back. Um, next week, we don't have a webinar. We uh, have a chance for you guys to get caught up on uh, what, you, what you may have missed or overlooked or rushed through. Um, so obviously, it's a public holiday, so go enjoy your long weekend, and uh, we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Uh, if anybody else would like to sort of stick around and just sort of chat about anything we've gone through tonight, feel free. But um, as far as the uh, rest of it goes, we'll be shutting off the recording now and uh, excellent. Thanks again for uh, coming back.